Praise the Lord, everyone. Let me just get some things out of the way before I forget. When you get to be my age, you start to forget things. First, I'd like to thank Elder Pompey. While I was gone, he, um, he killed a bunch of weeds that was disturbing me. I come home and saw a great big pile out in front of the house. So thank you to Elder Pompey. The other thing is, it's good to be home. Amen. I, I don't want anyone to think that the work that is going on over there is any more or any less important than what we're doing here. But it is a good work. It is good to be someplace where people are hungry for the word. I, I understand now why the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth that it's better to speak in a tongue that people can understand than 10,000 tongues that people can't understand because uh, there were more than one occasion I was in church and someone would get up and start speaking and everyone would get excited and I had no idea what they were talking about. And there were times when I spoke and would say something and I'm ready to move on to the next thought and then everybody got excited because they were waiting for the interpreter to f so once they heard it I'm ready to move on and then they was ready to say amen and clap their hands so it, it's it's different it really is but I think I think today uh, the message may be kind of geared towards something like what I have experienced there I didn't actually make or choose this message because of that, but certainly it does kind of fit in that same theme, and it is very important for us to remember that God is still trying or God is still saving souls. He is, and we need to understand that we are the workmen of the Lord, and there are times when God would ask of us to do things that we normally wouldn't do, but it's important that we do the work of the Lord. Well, he's mad. That's all right. And he don't even have a he don't even have a microphone and he's louder than me. I heard him say he's got a stomach ache. Amen. Poor fella. They just ain't happy at all. All right. Open your Bibles. I guess I'll try to out preach them. First Samuel. Chapter 22. And then in the book of Luke. Chapter number 14. First Samuel chapter 22. And then Luke. Chapter 14. I want to tie these two scriptures together and, and hopefully have a message for you. I, I was going to say that I didn't get home until 4 o'clock in the morning, so I haven't had a lot of sleep in case I didn't speak well, but I'll wait until I'm finished. If nobody gets excited, then I'll say <laughs> that um, I didn't have a lot of sleep. In, in the book of... 1 Samuel chapter 22 verses 1 through 4 it says David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave uh, to the cave Adullam and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it they went down thither to him and everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was dis, uh, discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men and David went thence to Mizpah of Moab and he said unto the king of Moab let my father and my mother I pray thee come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me Amen. and he brought them before the king of Moab and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hold. 
And when he says the hold here, he's talking about a stronghold. David was hiding out and trying to hear from the Lord. Then in the book of Luke, chapter number 14 and verse 16 through 24 says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and, his, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord all these things, the master of the house, or showing him all these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said this to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Lord said to his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And I would just like to use for a subject this morning, gather all the leftovers. I think one of the problems that we are running into today is so many people who have been to church and going to church and are wishy-washy about church. Those who, as the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, that are um, lukewarm and are not desiring to do for God I mean, when, you're, when you think about it, it's a sad thing for God to say, I would rather you not even be saved. When the Bible also tells us that it is not his will that any should perish, that he wants everyone. He didn't die for just a few. He came and died so that everybody that wants life, eternal life, can have it. And so for him to then turn around and say, I would rather you not even come to church and be saved is pretty strong when you think about the fact of what he's comparing that to. And that's to church folks that come to church but have lost their fire, that have lost their desire and their zeal to do what God wants them to do. They just come and fill the pews week after week after week and they they are pleased with themselves that they come to church they are pleased with the fact that they're giving God what they want but have no desire at all to give God what he wants I'll give money to the church but I'm not living holy I'll give my labor to the church but I'm not obeying the word. I'll do what seems right in my own eyes. But God will accept it because at least I come to church. And so the Lord said, I'd rather you not even come to church. I'd rather you not even know me than for you to come and get saved and then sit around and have no desire to do anything for me. And so I, I, the reason why I'm saying all of this is because David was a man that knew about serving God. And in this situation that he's in, he's being chased by Saul. I, I just let me sidebar just for a minute on this, because David is, is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible to me. This is a man who was anointed to be the next king. Right. <coughs> Excuse me, when he was a child. 
And it took years before he received the promise that God gave him. But in the midst of all of the problems that David was having, God was training him how to be a king. He knew how to be a shepherd. He knew how to protect those that were weak. But he did not know how to run a country. And the way God trained him on how to be a good king was to put him right in the house of a bad king so he could see all the things you shouldn't do. And that's the reason why I think saints shouldn't be just running from job to job. Sometimes God puts you in a bad place so that when he promotes you, you know how to do the right job. I wasn't always a pastor. I was a minister under other pastors for many years. And I watched and I took note of the things that I felt they should not do so that if God ever used me that way, I wouldn't make those same mistakes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I hope that the ministers in this place are learning from the mistakes that I make so that when they go out, they're able to, to, to do things even better than I do. If anybody's a parent, you understand what I mean. You should want your children to do better than you. And they're not my natural children, but those that are ministering here are learning from me, and hopefully they're taking the good, and some of the things that I don't do so well, they can improve on that and be even better. I'm not a jealous person. I'm not one of those guys that sit back, and if you ain't all about me, then, uh, then you have a problem. I'm not like that. I want... I want people to do better. I really do. I'm always about helping somebody do better. And I don't need the credit for it. I just need for, for somebody to not have to suffer and struggle like I have. That's all. Amen. So David understood because God put him in the house of the king. But then the king turned on him. And David had to run for his life. He was not... Just an average person. The women sang, Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. David was not just the run of the mill kind of a man. He was what the Bible calls a mighty man of valor. He was a good soldier. He knew how to fight and to defend and to offend. He knew how to go on the offense. He knew how to be in the defense. David also knew when it was time to just pack it all up and run. He knew that too. Sometimes we don't, you know, we feel like if, if, oh, if, I, if I run, then, then uh, there, that makes me look weak. David was not weak by any stretch of anybody's imagination. When he was challenged by the king, if you want to marry my daughter, you need to go do this. David went and did it against all odds. He still won. So he was not in anybody's opinion, unless you haven't read the Bible, he wasn't just another guy that knew how to fight. He was a soldier's soldier. He really knew what he was doing. But at this point in his life, he's on the run from the king. And it wasn't like David had a gathered all together all the people that he felt like would be on his side and was going to take over the kingdom. David waited for God to put him where he needed to be. David sat still until God said, get up and run. And when God told him to run, David ran. When God told him to fight, David fought. This, was in, this is in 1 Samuel chapter 22, but if you get to, to chapter 23, he's already won a battle. But look at what he did. He gathered all the nobodies that the king considered nobody. He gathered all those that were in distress. Everybody that had trouble in their life. He went out and got them and brought them in. All of those that were in debt. Those that couldn't or were not financially capable of taking care of their own self. He went out and he got all of those that were unhappy with the way things were going, but just going on about their day-to-day -day life. David had all of those people come. He gathered all of them to himself, 400 men. But I want you to know that when you do things the way God said do them, it will grow. David got all the nobodies in the kingdom 
Started off with 400, but by the time he's getting ready to fight his first battle, a short time later, he's already up to 600. People started gathering around. I, I, we need to understand that people will gather around excitement. People will gather around being treated nicely. Love draws those that are unloved. That's why I tell the saints all the time, treat people with love. When folks walk in these doors, treat them with love and respect. Don't just say somebody else go speak to them. You speak to them. Because love draws. And this is what David is doing. David was a man who knew how to treat people. And so all of those that were unhappy gathered themselves together to David. And when others started seeing the excitement, they started gathering themselves together too. It wasn't too long, David had a crowd. But I want you to understand something. That even in the midst of all of this, David still sought the Lord. David didn't just jump out and do what seemed right in his eyes. He didn't get the idea. Well, God already anointed me king. I guess it's time for me to take the old one out and for me to be elevated to the position. He didn't do that. He took care of his family. And then he sought the Lord. What do you want me to do? God told him through the priest, God, or through the prophet, God told him what he should do. And David was obedient to that. Now, I, one thing I love about God, he doesn't try to cover the wrong of anybody. You look at the lives of the people in the Bible that we put up on a high pedestal, but God still shows you their wrong. David didn't live a life of perfect holiness. He didn't do that. If you, if you go back one chapter, you'll see David was talking to the priest and was lying to him. Now, the Bible doesn't say God didn't jump on David for lying. This was a different dispensation, y'all. Don't go away thinking that it's okay to tell lies as long as you're doing it for God. That's, that's not true. We're living in a different time now. Tell the truth and deal with the consequences of it. Amen. That's what we should be doing today. But God didn't even rebuke David for telling the lie. But David got the priest and all of his family and all of the people, men, women, and children in the city, killed because of that. Amen. That's a different sermon altogether. I'll leave that alone. He was a man that never attempted to use the fact that God was dealing with him as a tool to hurt or destroy or damage others. I wish we could get that. Sometimes we think that just because God told me something that I need to just be mean and bully people. You don't have to do that. If God is dealing with you, you don't have to be mean to anybody. And if God is going to promote you, you don't have to step on the head or shoulders of anybody else. God will put you where he wants you, when he wants you. The Bible tells us, be sure your gifts will make room for you. God knows how to do it. So you don't have to help him out. Hey Amen. I'll say that again. You don't have to help God. He knows how to handle his business. He knows how to do what, what he wants to do, even when you sit back and do nothing. All right, that's enough about David. Let's talk about Jesus and what he said. I want to I tie these two together. David used, or David gathered all the nobodies. Jesus here is given a parable about the Great Supper. And talking about the kingdom of heaven. David is talking about, or Jesus is talking about the, the church age and the, the time that we are living in even now and what God was doing. He came to his own and asked them to come. The marriage supper. Come, come on to my house to the marriage supper. I want to be married to you. And I know I don't want to 
anybody to walk away thinking that in a carnal sense, but in a spiritual sense, God was choosing a companion for himself. He chose a group of people, and one by one, they all started to make excuses why they couldn't do what he said. Some people was just scared of being kicked out of the church. So they refused to acknowledge who he was. There were others who refused because they were in high positions. If you look, up, look at Nicodemus, he even come kind of in the, the corner back in the night, right. sliding up to Jesus, trying to find out, good master. Now he want to talk to Jesus and give him some recognition. Good master. Wait a minute. Why didn't he come during the day? Because he was afraid of what those that were making excuses would do to him. Right, right. Same thing with Joseph of Arimathea. It wasn't until Jesus was dead that Joseph of Arimathea stepped out. Okay, well, I'll take his dead body and bury it. But he was hiding in the shadows all the time Jesus was walking on the earth. And so he's talking about those who he came to. I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that, that I'm trying to use the scripture out of its context, because I'm not. I just want to apply it to this situation today. Those who we have been going out and trying to gather in are just making excuses. I can't come today because, well, my child is playing softball. I can't come today because, well, this is the first time in the next 50 years that this event's going to take place and I just need to make sure I get a picture of it. I can't come today because, well, my family only gathers once a year and so I have to go to my family gathering. We come up with all kind of excuses. I'm on my honeymoon. Amen. I don't went to meddling now. That's not talking about that. That's talking about choosing your spouse over God. That's what that's talking about. Well, I have a wife now. And my wife wants me to go with her to the beach on Sunday mornings. I have a husband now. My husband don't like me going to church. So I have to slip and go whenever I can, whenever I can do it. If he has to work overtime, then I'll be there. Amen. Sometimes you just have to stand up and do what is right. I know about that. I'm not saying anything that I haven't lived through my own self. Amen. I've been whipped for going to church. I've been starved for going to church. I have been talked down to and talked about for going to church. I have been publicly humiliated for going to church. Not by my wife. Amen. She didn't do that. My dad did all of that. But there comes a time in your life when you have to take a stand for what you believe, for what you know is right. You can't just go by what other people say. This is what they were doing. They were just coming up with excuses. I would go, but, and then come up with an excuse. We're doing the same thing today. We keep chasing behind people who don't want what you're giving. We're chasing behind people who aren't interested in God, but we're trying to persuade them. It's time for us to go out and gather those that are discontented with the church world today. Those who are not having a whole lot of money. See, sometimes we won't invite people to church because they're poor. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me give you a good example. A lot of churches don't have a deaf ministry because deaf people are poor people. Deaf people are on disability. They don't make a lot of money, so we're not going to invest a lot of money. I'm not just saying that. I know a pastor. Hallelujah. Let me stop now. Uh, the Lord is not dealing with me that way. Well, it costs too much money. You know why? Because they wasn't bringing in money. It's time for us to stop worrying about what people can do for the church. What can we do for them? What can we do to get people to come in? We need to stop worrying about those who are making up excuses why I can't come and start going out to the ones that have nothing. Those 
who are discontented with the world today, those that are discontented with the religious system today, show them that God has something better. Show them that God can still say. Show them that God still loves people. We need to start gathering those people in and stop worrying about all of those that fit the bill that we laid out. Oh, they have a nice car. I'm going to invite them to come to church. No, invite somebody on a bicycle to come to church. Invite somebody out walking to come. It's time for us to leave them alone that's making excuses and to start gathering in everybody else that's willing to come. This ain't about making money. This isn't about numbers. This isn't about puffing somebody up. It's about helping people get saved. Do we want souls to be saved? Sometimes we got to walk away from our loved ones because they just keep making excuses. Leave them alone. They're not tired of sin. They're not tired of the problems that they have. They're not tired of what the life of this world is doing to them. Leave them alone and let them get what good enough. And start calling for everybody else. We need to, if you think about what Jesus said, the master, he was angry about those who wouldn't come. It's time for us to leave those alone. We're trying over and over and over, begging practically our family. Leave your family alone. Go to McDonald's and invite somebody. Go out to Porky's and invite somebody. Go to the homeless shelter and invite somebody. Quit worrying about those that have things and start inviting anybody that'll come. God can save anybody. There was a a songwriter that wrote, uh, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody. Now, when he told the story, he was lying. Hey, man, I'm not messing with people's music now, and I'm really going to be in trouble. Hey, man, he come making up some story, and then that's, that's what the song was about. He was lying. He, wasn't, he didn't go to his mama's house, and she was sick, and the doctor came, and, and then he asked, what's wrong with you? And he just said, well, I'm just a nobody. No, that sounds good, but that's a lie. Really? The truth of the matter is we are a bunch of nobodies. And it's time for us to go out and get other nobodies. God began to bless with a group of people that weren't even important. Here what Jesus is talking about, the Jews were the ones that he chose. The Bible said he set his affection on Israel. He chose them to be his people. And they rejected him. So he went and got a people that were not a people. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have anything today. We would be the tail and not the head. But God had to flip it around because they didn't want him. They wanted what they wanted. It's time for us to leave those alone that want what they want alone. And start getting those that just want something. They don't know what they want. They're just hungry. I'll take anything. I tell my wife that all the time. We go to the restaurant and it don't take me but a minute and I know what I'm getting. She's sitting and looking. After a while, she'll say, what do you want? What, do you, what are you going to get? And I'll tell her, oh, you getting that? <laughs> Especially if we go to Cracker Barrel. I don't even have to look at the menu. Sometimes I'll just tell them, don't even give it to me. I know what I want. Uh, yeah, when you're hungry, it don't take a long time. It's How quick can you get to the table? I'm ready to order. Uh, would you like some water? Yes, and I'm ready to order my meal right now. When you're hungry, that's what you do. Hey, man, y'all understand what I'm saying? We busy fooling with folks that ain't hungry. So they're trying to pick and choose. Well, uh, you know, you need to come to church. Well, do y'all have any program for children? How about programs for senior citizens? Do you have any senior programs at your church? That, you know what they're doing? T- they're trying to pick off the menu. When you're hungry, yes, I'll take it. Save the menu. Go back and get me some toast, and I want some eggs and some bacon. Hallelujah. Two orders of bacon. When you're hungry, you know what you want. You'll take what you can get. But when you're not hungry, all of a sudden, everything on the menu is a puzzle to you. I don't understand it. McDonald's hasn't changed their menu in 20 years. 
I want a number two with a large fry and a large Diet Coke. That's all. I don't have to sit there and study the menu. Hmm. You don't have to do all of that when you're hungry. Give me a hamburger. Those are the kind of people that we should be trying to get now in the church. The time for fooling around with people that don't want God is over. Go out and get people that are hungry. People that want to know what can God do. My life is in shambles. What can God do to help me? We need to go out and gather the leftovers. Everybody the other churches don't want, gather them and bring them in. Everybody that other people don't want, bring them in. The ones that people won't talk to in the neighborhood because they don't dress well enough, bring them in. We don't care. Bring them in and we'll show them some love. Bring them in and God will save them. Stop fooling around with everybody else. As soon as they start looking over the menu, just go on and walk away from them and go get somebody that's not trying to figure out what's on the menu. Go gather in everybody. We need to do like what Jesus said. He said, go out into the highways and compel. Go, get, go, go into the hedges. Go, go places where nobody else want to go. Nobody want to hang around in the hedges. That's where, that's where poor folks as homeless live. Go, in, go into the hedges and get them. Bring them in. Go. And then when the house still wasn't full, he said, all right, then go out in the highways. Just go get people. Bring them in. Let me deal with whether they say. Because if you keep on going, you'll see where at some point when the marriage supper came, he finally told one man that didn't have on a wedding garment, he said, how did you get in here? He didn't tell the church. He didn't tell the ones that he said, go out and bid them to come. He, he didn't tell them to ask, what are you doing in here? Y'all let God do that. We bring them in. I have folks all the time telling me, well, you know so-and-so ain't living right. But I ain't, I, don't you worry about that. Let them keep coming. Maybe they'll catch on fire. Let them keep coming. Maybe something will be said, and they'll want to get right. But you sitting around pointing your fingers at them is not going to change them. Sitting around whispering when they walk by is not going to change them. Man, y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't think we got a big problem in this church like that. But I want to keep on emphasizing it so we don't get a problem like that. Anybody that walks in the doors, we need to show them love. Anybody that comes to this place, we need to tell them about what God can do, the goodness of the Lord. I know some of us were saved all of our life. But for the rest of us who God brought up out of the muck and mire, the ones that God brought out of the house of sin, the ones that God picked up, out of the bed with some man or woman that you wasn't married to, the ones that was laying in the gutters, drunk, going from house to house, stealing so you can get drug money. For those that have those kind of experiences, let them know God can clean you up. God can save and he can help you. Those are the ones that we should be coming after. Amen? Leave the rest of them alone. You know the song? So long, fare thee well. Man, that's what we ought to be singing to some of these folks. So long, fare thee well. I'm through with you. I'm moving on to somebody that wants something. Amen. Let's stop sitting at home and doing nothing but reading our Bibles. Let's start getting in the streets and driving and drawing and compelling people to come that want something different in their life. Amen. And the ones that keep saying, well, maybe next week, leave them alone. And that's not, that's not sinful. That's what God did. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not telling you to do something that only God can do, but a principle was laid down. Sometimes you just need to leave some folks alone spend time praying and you'll be surprised when you start spending time with those that nobody else wants to spend time with you'll start getting a crowd around you you'll start gathering in people folks will start saying you know what I don't know what they're doing over there but I think I want some of that All right. amen amen, amen. you know I use the example before there's been times when I, I'm eating something and I ask my wife you want something new no. you short nope I don't want anything I'm full Okay, I get mine, and I'm eating, and I get to the last bite. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. You get to the last bite. Well, honey, can I have that? You know what love says? Love says, yes, dear. I'm not there yet. I love my wife a lot, but I tell her, you no. When I said, did you want something? When I took the first bite, I would have shared half my sandwich with you. But there's something about when you get your mind about that last piece you're getting ready to eat, you ready for that. And then for somebody to come out, oh, can I have that? Nope. Amen. We, we, we need to go out and gather those that want something to eat. You know, you can eat, you can eat food and make it look so good that somebody that ain't hungry want to eat it. That's the way we ought to be with God. They ought to see us and say, I don't know what they got, but I, I want some of that. Amen. Amen. All right. Come on, Elder Pompey.